This episode is sponsored by Law Tigers New Mexico. Law Tigers New Mexico have been fighting insurance companies on your behalf since 2001. With Law Tigers, you never ride alone. Welcome back to the Rust is Gold Racing Podcast. We've got a really great guest, a really great guest, somebody that we've looked up to as far as motorcycle builds for some time. Down the way, not too far, an old time rockabilly copy bar. Wreck a machine tucked in the back, Elvis singing about a Cadillac. I'm on a BSA, been riding all day. Leather's on, goggles too, triumphing, I don't know what you want to do. My boys are on Ducati's, happen now all the while. Yeah, these are rockers, it's his style. So let's ride, so let's ride. Tyson, who, who do we have on the show today? Uh, Long time builder. Super, I don't want to say, fam- I guess you'd say famous, right? He's pretty famous he's in the pretty motorcycle famous. world. I mean, he's up there. Uh, none other than Dustin Cott, famous for, you've probably seen a few of his bikes. Um, the one that he built for Ryan Reynolds, which is that Triumph Thruxton, that got a lot of notoriety across the motorcycle scene. Um, I first saw that on Cafe Racer Magazine and then also their television show. Yeah. And uh, once he... <clears throat> was featured on that what was that probably like eight years ago oh, i think it's longer than that maybe yeah 10. uh maybe 10 years ago once he was featured on that magazine and then also the show and then that bike was kind of sponsored by triumph and went from coast to coast i believe that kind of put him really on the map i mean you can't get anything bigger than that at that point right no not especially not for cafe racers at that time yeah so we're super excited um, we also have a lot of big guests coming up in the next year. So for this next year of podcasting, we have some big names in the motorcycle industry. And, uh, you know, it's just this podcast just keeps getting bigger and bigger, right? Yeah. I'm enjoying it. You still enjoying this? <laughs> well, when you get to p- talk to people like Dustin Cott, right? right. How could you not? Uh, famous, amazing builder. So let's, uh, let's get into it. You ready? Yep. I'm ready. Let's do this. Hey guys. We want to say first off and foremost, like, thank you for your time. We know you're super busy, um, but you're you're one of the pristine builders kind of in the country. I mean, you're well known. Um, what's your, uh, how did all this start? I mean, like we, we can get into your backstory of you, you know, yeah. watching your dad and stuff in the motorcycle scene, but when did you really start to like get well known for the motorcycle industry stuff that you're doing? Yeah, I know. That's even still strange to me, really, because I I don't feel like I'm terribly talented at this, especially when I compare myself to guys that I am inspired by. Um, But I will take credit for having put my work boots on for the last 25 years, you know, Um, especially having sort of a passion about this as early as my early teens uh, and starting to get into the restoration. It started really with uh, mostly because these bikes were so affordable and so plentiful uh, it wasn't even my first choice. I mean, even as I sit in my shop right now, I've got pictures of Norton Commandos and Triumphs and, and old school board track racers, all the stuff that I really loved growing up. But that, that was unapproachable even back then. Yeah. Uh, as far as I never had two nickels to rub together, really. Uh, and then so, but there were people that were willing to give me a hundred bucks to get an old Honda out of their backyard. You know what I'm saying? And so, uh, I guess the necessity was the mother of invention with trying to apply some of the things that I was inspired by from some of the machines that I fell in love with, like I said, as early as early teens. And mostly because I grew up kind of off the beaten path and I felt sort of confined. And every time I had a a little dirt bike, our dad got my twin brother and I a dirt bike when we were like 10. And I would steal a cigarette from my older sister and I'd take the dirt bike out on the highway and go as far as I thought I could before, you know, his co-workers or someone would see me. And I just remember that feeling like motorcycles making the world kind of a big place. And then uh, and then once I finally had a couple of tools to make some messes of things, um, just trying to contribute some of the things uh, artistically, some of those cues to affordable machines like Hondas. Uh, so that's a that's a that's a broad way of answering your question but it kind of touches on a back on the background and also uh why i got involved and then to really answer the uh, the initial question is when did people start realizing that i was in my little tent shed doing this i don't know i i feel like i kind of got lucky there were people that saw something that i didn't see i never i'm 43 years old so i don't i'm not really a product of the social media 
craze or anything else, but I there were friends that came alongside me and said, "You've got something really neat going on here, and uh, you've you're starting to make a little bit of a splash, and people are recognizing it," which seemed ludicrous to me. And then, especially if I look back on some of the successes I've had, it's gone on ludicrously further than ever anticipated. And it's not why I got into it in the first place. I just thought that if I had a steady stream of vintage motorcycles and some of the ideas that I was incorporating on them, I thought that I could probably create a little bit of, not necessarily like a living, but sort of a lifestyle. And I could probably create some longevity out of doing this, which was my main intention. So did you start off working on hondas was that sort of the the initial bikes that you started with yeah I, I like right behind me in the shop i've got my little 66 s90 which was my first bike and it was my it was sitting in my grandfather's backyard and uh i started taking an interest in it because uh, my dad he actually kicked me out of the house when i bought my first 750 and that was the rule he said if you want to ride that little s90 you can live under this roof but <laughs> if you ever want a real motorcycle you're gonna have to move out and he stuck to it, man. I showed up on my first 750, and he said, uh, that's a beautiful motorcycle up front. Whose is it? I said, well, it's mine, Dad. <laughs> and he said, I guess you're going to have to find a new place to live. Uh, so that that there started my quest of two-car garages until I finally found my shop. But uh, my S90 was the first bike that I restored, and I got it done before my grandfather passed away. And he loved it because it, it had been in the family. His brother bought it, and then it belonged to his brother's son, which was my dad's cousin and it was my dad's and it was my grandfather's and now it's mine i still have it i actually almost sold it to chip foos after at the golden bolt show in 2018 he loved it and the the backstory of it and everything else but that was the first bike that i got my hands on and uh like i said it had nothing to do with a love affair of hondas it was just the fact that honda had made so many of them they weren't Cowies are cool, and the other Japanese marquees are really great, but they just didn't have the same output as Honda. And so I remember the Cycle Trader. I'm sure you guys remember flipping through that. You couldn't get past the pages of inline four Hondas. Oh, yeah, <laughs> for sure. I was interested in them, really. Um, they yep. just seemed kind of like it was four carburetors, and they weren't British, and I really liked the sound of the twins. And uh, But eventually – you know, by the time you get to the fact, to the point where you're like, I really want to have a motorcycle that can do real things and take me real places. Um, Honda seemed to be the only one that was abundantly available. And like I said, people used to, people would like pay me to get them out of their garage at that, you know, when I was in my early 20s, late teens, it was just an eyesore, uh, something that the, the sprinklers had been splashing on for the last 10 years in the backyard. And um, it was just a, a tarp with the cat living on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Under wood pile. And that was so, the good old days, man. That was the good old <laughs> days when you could pick up a CB750. If somebody wasn't trying to get rid of it, you could take it for three hundred dollars in great shape. Those so days that, are long gone. <laughs> yeah, with with paperwork, with, paperwork. with, <laughs> with the title. Um, yeah, so you guys, you're, you're no stranger to that. Um, and again, it was just uh, necessity created the invention of what I was doing and the plentiful aspect of those Hondas laying around led to what it's become, I suppose. So a lot of people, when they look at your builds, they see, you know, obviously the aesthetic and the simplicity of it in a way that makes the bike look like, I want to say like a piece of art because everything looks very simple and streamlined and you can see the tank and you can see the metal work and all that. Um, when did you first get into metal work though? Because that's... A, it's a very tough skill that only a few, I think personally, only a few bike builders can really master at the level that you've been able to get it at. I see. Um, yeah, I think it was because the only thing that was available, uh, like in the mid 2000s, when I really started to take this more seriously, I'd say as early as 03, is when my friends started paying me to do modifications to their bikes. Uh, at that time, I was selling them for like 1200 bucks. finished. That seemed like a, it was like, wow, I got 1200 bucks for a, one of these bikes. But uh, the only thing available was fiberglass. And whether you wash it, wax it, paint it, it, it still looks like fiberglass. Sure. Uh, and so it, there just seemed, uh, it just seemed like mediocre options for sort of what I was inspired by. Uh, and then I finally started using old pots and pans in the kitchen to start bending flat stock bar or round by quarter inch round bar and then just trying to cage 
sort of a, the cow, the cowling that I was looking for. And then I started getting into the fuel tanks. What I really started doing was using tanks that came off of different bikes and I'd run them on frames I never really belonged to. And then I'd have to match it with a seat cowling that fit. Uh, and then trying to create a, a nice linear aspect that all great cafe racers have. Uh, one thing led to another, and I started this with an angle grinder and a screwdriver, seriously. And then as you go, um, and as you have a little, a few more successes monetarily, I just started reinvesting in the tools that I always needed. Uh, and now I have a pretty, a pretty well outfitted shop. And I think um, one thing that leads to another. You know, you do it, you do it the hard way, and I'm glad that I did. Uh, and then all of a sudden, someone comes alongside and says, you know, there's a tool that does that. Right. And you go, I don't even know what I don't know. I don't so, even know, yeah. know what tools I don't have. Some old timer uh, comes up and tells you you've been doing it the hard way the whole time. Exactly. And I wouldn't have changed it for the world, truthfully, because the hard way teaches you how to think correctly about it. Mm -hmm. And if you can think correctly about things, there's a tool that will, that will solve the problems you're having. But not everyone knows how to think about it correctly. Uh, and so that's, you know, you come to enough dead ends in your mind with metalwork, especially because you're taking, you're really trying to capture trigonometry and geometry out of thin air with flat sheet metal Um and then turn it into, and you know, once you've been playing around with these shapes for as long as, as well, as long as I have, I've been doing it. Uh, it's funny when I'm making those tanks, I can actually see them turning into the same contours and angles that I'm so familiar with through all the years of having done this. And so even when I make my own custom tanks, people say, wow, it looks like something Honda would have made in the 70s. And that's always been sort of a default uh, for my design cues is trying to make something look if they had the opportunity and no red tape, no bureaucracy, no nothing, when these bikes were being produced brand new, what could they have come up with artistically? Yeah. Uh, they were able to incorporate uh, other types of influences. What would they have done? And so that's always been a default setting for my design cues. Well, I think one of the things that you kind of nailed down, which like Steve and I kind of agree on, he's a BMW guy. I'm a British guy. Um, but I think one of the things we both agree on is like when we look at a bike like yours, you can look at any of your builds and say, okay, this is what I think they should have gone with Honda or Kawasaki or any of these brands. This is what BMW should have gone with. This is what Triumph should have gone with had they had none of like the emissions and, and all the other kind of stuff that they have to do. And that's one of the things that I like about your builds is I think when you start your build, you can look at the bike and say, okay, if they had done this right or they could have done it their way, we're going to scrap all this extra stuff and we're going to take it back to the bare bones. Right. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I, I feel bad because, like I said, they're just knee deep in restrictions and red tape and how many eyes it, these designs have to go be, go through before something's agreed upon. And there's probably so much compromise along the way. Um, where it's like we, what we really wanted to do was this, but we had to settle for this. And pretty soon you got a, a room full of people sitting in a movie theater with, and watching a movie no one wants to watch, you know. Yeah, yeah. Only frustration of that. Well, but I, I think it's kind of interesting because you, and probably because like you said, Inventions, the mother of necessity, is you were able to sort of come out right at the time that the cafe racer resurgence was happening and you were doing these cool throwback builds and you had access to cheaper bikes to be able to work on and all of that stuff kind of happened all in one probably 10 year period you know and it was like that's when tyson and i sort of were into the cafe racer thing too which was like 10 12 years ago and you had really made these really clean and streamlined cafe racers how do you feel like that sort of changed now? Because the whole cafe racer thing is sort of, it's a little quieter again. You don't, it, it's not at its peak like it was 10 years ago. Yeah. I, well said, you touched on something there too, where um, I had already had grease under my fingernails for as many as 10 years. And it felt like one of those things where a trend had caught up with me and not the other way around. Right. Because if I tried to get into this now, there's there's some guys that I mean I think of guys even LA based like Max is on and Shinya who's always been one of my heroes Shinya Kamira yeah and other guys they just make me want to pull, put my tools away sure uh, and uh, it's so inspiring like just on a whole different level of of thoughtfulness and creativity and everything else and skill set but um, touching on what you said like I had already 
I already had a, a few milestones of my own 10 years ago. And then I had, I was fortunate enough to have, like I said, some people come alongside and say, look, there's this thing called social media that's happening. And uh, you, it, you, know, you don't just have to be LA based anymore. Even though your shop's here, you could become worldwide as far as being recognized with these designs and everything else. And I, I feel really, really fortunate to have been doing it at that time. Uh, because, like you said, and it, it will come back again. Sure. I've watched, I've watched this cafe racer, motorcycles in general. Um, people identify with motorcycles culturally so much. I don't think that's ever really going away. They just, they just use different machines at different times for their expression. And cafe racers definitely had their heyday uh, in the let's just say let's call it tw- two thousand nine through especially seventeen. Uh, that was a real that was a real peak of interest, uh, and once the major manufacturers caught on to what was happening, I think that some of the luster disappeared because then it wasn't. Most people didn't even know they wanted a cafe racer until they saw one, right? <laughs> that was that's been a majority of my customers uh, that which that my customer base has changed so much. But most guys didn't even know they wanted it until they saw it. And they said, I've never seen anything like that before. And my my objective was always trying to capture the attention of someone who otherwise would never, ever be interested in motorcycles. Um, and so trying to capture the attention of like a housewife by using metal finishes like copper and brass, making it almost look like an appliance from the 60s. And that's a way that you can get yourself in front of people that otherwise could not, not necessarily care about a motorcycle but may even have a stigma against them sure uh, and that, that was kind of a that was a little bit of a, a theory that i had at the time and then i i th- you guys were around long enough to uh, to watch a cafe cowboy i think but that was something that was totally unexpected i worked uh, as a wrangler for Harley Davidson uh, on their photo shoots for their catalogs and motor clothes and things like that and the uh, ironically they had a British company that did their catalog for them um, I guess they didn't really trust the Wisconsin eye for fashion and uh, uh, and, and trending type things so the art director of that photo shoot was kind of taken aback I showed up and I had cowboy boots on and like an old slouch cap and i'm riding this kind of dainty honda cafe racer he, he, he thought man you'd look more normal on a chopper or something like what's the deal with this bike and then uh, i kind of explained my story and he was intrigued by it and so he did an introspective look at the shop with that short film called cafe cowboy and mm-hmm. overnight it got like half a million views that was the first time i ever understood the power of social media and i I couldn't get past the pages of emails that I got overnight, uh, pages and pages and pages from all around the world. And I, I wish I was better prepared for that opportunity because everyone kept asking me, what's for sale? They, it wasn't a sales pitch. And I think that's why people um, were really inspired by it because there was nothing on the other end of it. I, they, I, people were like, do you have keychains or T-shirts or yeah. swag? I, I said, no, it's just a story about this little shop and these bikes that I'm interested in. And uh, so you touched on something there, which was the right at the outset of this trending, I had already got my feet wet with it, and I just happened to be at the right place at the right time for once in my life, right? <laughs> um, so that that was kind of a curious time frame in my life. You know, you and I um, and Tyson all met at Handbuilt Show, and I think it was three years ago. It was like the year before COVID or two years before COVID in Austin. And a uh, good friend of ours, Paul Ford, who's a huge fan of yours, um, who's going to love this podcast. Uh, he's definitely a fanboy. Um, we were all talking to you about the BMW build that you had done. Mm-hmm. I think it was a R100, and uh, it was super clean. It was all raw metal. and. Oh. Um, Gotcha. Yep. You remember that one? And uh, yep. I'd been trying to find pictures of that before we did this podcast, and I couldn't really find any of that particular build that you had at the handbuilt show. But that bike to me was like the best BMW build I had ever seen. And I'm a huge BMW fan. And it was, you know, not a lot of BMWs were being built as cafe racers early on. It was always CB750s or um, Kawasaki's, KZs. But that particular build that you had done was just like, wow, that was exactly what I would have wanted to do as a build for a BMW cafe racer. What Whatever happened to that bike? I'm, I'm just curious. 
Yeah, uh, thanks for the compliments on that, by the way. I appreciate it. And I, whenever I look at a past project, I always, I'm always i my own worst critic. So I think, oh, I'm revisited by past sins, what I could have done differently. But sometimes you just have to let it go and say, that's the best I could do at that time. But I appreciate your compliment on that. Uh, and that uh, the, the backstory of those BMWs and also branching out uh, from Hondas was that I I didn't want to just be a one-trick pony in here because I think people thought that they knew the whole story. It's like, oh, great, just another Honda by Cot. Great, thanks, appreciate it. Well done. <laughs> uh, move. And so uh, the, even even my own artistic expression needed uh, a different machine to lay some of my, hopefully, my skill set out on. But that bike, I ended up raffling that BMW, uh, and we, had, we found a little loophole with the California raffle type thing and other builders asking us how we were how we were doing it and uh, i won't get into the details of that but the uh, that bike ended up going to a guy locally here in uh, los angeles uh, and it was i had a huge trash can of names and just stuck my hand in there and pulled his name out and uh it's still here in in the la area somewhere maybe like in woodland hills oh cool uh, Oh, if the guy rides it that much, he was like a circus bear on it. He was like this giant. <laughs> and, uh, and that, wow, uh, it definitely wasn't designed for you, but he read it. Oh, man. Um, and it was funny. Like, I, he probably needed help getting off the thing. But uh, it was, it ended up with him. And, and that was a great build. It was, I called it the Exodus. That was what yeah. I nicknamed it. That's right. And uh, it is because it was a, it was a departure from the expectations of what I normally was doing. And it was also, sort of my um, first reveal as far as the honesty of where I was at with metalworking. So I didn't really try to hide any of the mistakes, and I, I don't believe in that. Because no matter how much I try to perfect any build, whenever I'm finished, I might as well either give it to, give it to you or do it myself, but take a ball-peen hammer and hit it somewhere, because that's what's going to happen. Sure. And you it's almost better to get it out of the way first. You know what I mean? I think, mean? you know, personally... We go to a lot of shows because that's just part of what we do in the in the in the business and the the motorcycle fascination world. But uh, when we had been walking around the event that day, we were all looking at different bikes, and there was a lot of cool builds there. But once we saw that one, both Steve, I, and Sparky, and a couple buddies were with, we were just like, "Wow, look at the metal work on this!" And Steve was freaking out about it, especially because <laughs> he's a BMW guy. Okay. But like the way you'd shaped the front, you know, um, fender. And the way you'd run the pipes up and around, and then oh, you'd kind of done like that race fairing on the bottom of it, all yeah. in pure metal. I was fascinated, not because I'm a BMW guy at all, but just the simple like ability of leaving a bike or a build full metal. You're really putting like you're you're putting you're exposing ev everything that you've ever done. I yeah. feel as like a, as a metal guy, you're you're putting all your your errors and your faults and also like your skills for the world to see and that's really like why i stopped and we kind of all you know took notes on that bike so much was that you know you're really not you're putting everything you have on the line there and i yeah. i thought well like wow what an amazing job he did and to like show off your 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 talent at that exact moment was just it was cool i love anything bare metal you know it just it says a lot well, I appreciate you saying that. Like I said, I mean, you know how it is. You guys have built, built bikes yourselves. It's a little bit like someone sneaking in your room and peeking through your diary under your pillowcase. It's sure. kind of like, I didn't do it for you. I, I just, I didn't even, I didn't even really know what I was writing down or doing at the time. It just kept turning into something. And as those doors open, walking through them. And then you might as well be honest about it, right? It's just... Uh, even with the flaws and it, no better show than to bring it to called the hand built show. Right. Uh, I could, I could walk you through. I could, if I had filmed myself, you'd see the whole process taking place and even welding that fuel tank together, which was a total bitch to make the thing blew up, literally blew up. I had, I kept trying to get to one little corner and I was chasing the dragon. And I don't know if you guys weld aluminum, but sometimes when it gets dirty, it starts, it's like trying to weld cigarette ash together. And then it was, I was spraying acetone on it. It got filled with acetone. The thing turned into a bomb. It blew the whole front of the tank out. I took a defeat shower, like an hour long 
defeat shower and thought, oh, what am I even doing with this? And so many times I wanted to quit and uh, through the years of doing this. And I don't even bother reading comment sections anymore. You just get hung yeah. on the cross with certain things. I was just going to ask you about that because yeah. not only people criticizing your work, and usually it's people who couldn't lift a hammer if they needed to, but also the type of bike you're building. You know, it's like everybody's got something critical to say about whether you're, it's a cafe racer, whether it's your metal work, whether it's the style of bike or it's a purist saying, why did you want to, why did you do that to this bike that could have been totally stock and beautiful? I mean, how do you deal with that? Because you really put yourself out there and especially like shows like the handbill show or the one show, it's like, how do you deal with that feedback? Uh, I mean, you know, as well as I, that, not everyone can be where you were when you found your donor project, right? I mean, if I had, I should take before photos as I'm with a pick and shovel digging half the motorcycle out of someone's backyard. <laughs> That's it's true. A, this wasn't a survivor, bro. I didn't want to go back to stock because there's nothing stock left on it, right? All I needed was a skeleton of this thing so that I could give it fresh life and do something that no one's ever seen with one of these machines. What's, what's the more noble cause? And so, uh, knowing that knowing what the actual truth is has has really helped me to develop thick skin. With uh, and I, there's times where I'm in my shop and I think to myself, please tell me I'm not the guy who knows more about this than someone else, right? That's a terrifying spot to be in. And so everyone loves to attribute more. They they create their own narrative about what you're doing. Mm. And it's like I didn't make any of these claims. I'm just. I'm just a student like everyone else. Uh, I'm open for interpretation and also some some positive, hopefully positive feedback. But even if it is negative and well deserved, uh, you got to put that in your in your back pocket and deal with it. And uh, hopefully, it inspires you to do even better the next time. But there have been a few times where I crumbled underneath some of that because you think no one knows the mistakes that that have been made better than I do, right? And if you if you had to explain why you decided to run it, uh, it would be a, a worthy and explanation. It would be like, oh, okay, I get it. Now I see. But you don't really have the luxury of that. So when you put something out there, you should come to expect uh, that it. Thank God I'm not writing songs or doing something even more emotive. <laughs> I can, imagine, can you imagine being an actor and watching your own movies? I would, damn theater watch do it to put myself through that so thankfully it's just some rolling piece of artwork if you want to call it that well it's it's it is stressful you know like um we've we've all built a few bikes and we've sold a few and we worked on other people's stuff and for me and and i know for steve here too we had to make a conscious decision at one point and just say hey like this is owning a coffee shop racing vintage motorcycles having our own bikes and then trying to build bikes for other people is just too much it became too much for me to bite off because you're not just building the bike aesthetically for someone to look at. You're also building something that now they're going to have to run on the streets and not mm-hmm. everybody knows mechanics or knows the, some, you know, the intricate aspects of a vintage bike and how to tune four carbs or whatever. So they're always going to be coming back with questions and, and how to's. And yeah. at some point it almost becomes, I don't want to say like a hassle, but you really have to love the idea of building a bike for like a relationship that you're almost going to have with a person dude so well said and the and the other thing is too interviewing the person you're going to build for and i tell guys all the time i'm like the most fun i've ever had on any motorcycle trip is when things went wrong uh whether it was mechanically or whatever but the, nothing even interesting happens until you're broken down on the side of the road uh, and uh, with a vintage machine, even after I'm done with it, every nut and every bolt, stem to stern, bottom to top, it's basically a brand new 50-year-old motorcycle. I tell them, you are going to have a problem with this. Mm-hmm. The likelihood of it being simple or simplified because of what I've already done to this bike is that you know, there's a good chance that it's going to be something like, oh, you forgot to turn the gas on, and that will come with time. But you are going to have problems with it. If you're not the kind of guy who can romanticize about cool things happening on the side of the road this isn't the machine for you like just buy something new so you can call harley davidson or whatever and bitch at them Uh, but i'm like trust me it's not for a lack of of painstakingly going through this motorcycle and trying to give you the best uh the best experience possible on this but you are going to have problems that's just the nature 
of almost any machine, but especially a vintage motorcycle, because they require a rider, and that's why I love them. Uh, like a new bike, you just hit the start button, it, it, you feel like it could take off without you. Um, and the hardest part is staying awake on the thing. There's, <laughs> there's not a lot of mechanical feedback, and there's, it just doesn't need that same rider participation. Um, and one of my mechanics, I didn't really condone him saying this, but this guy, we had a, a particularly troublesome client, and the guy, literally, I'm not even making fun of him because I've done this too, but he ran his bike out of gas. And it's okay, like that stuff happens. But when it, when it got here to the shop, I took the tank off and I thought, too light, <laughs> right, as the tank came off. Like, well, that couldn't be the problem. I mean, I want to take this guy seriously. <laughs> and then we put the ass in it, fired it up, and and my uh, this mechanic that works for me, he's, he's probably 75 by now. And he's one of those guys who knows, he's the whisperer. Um, so he calls the client back and says, we found the problem is the loose connection between the rider and the machine. Oh, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I have my mouth wide open. I'm like, dude, you can't talk to guys like that. But it, it made an impression. Hearing that from a 75-year-old guy, like that'll that'll humble you, right? But I thought from that point forward, it, I, I'll never forget him saying that. Mm. It was like there's a loose connection between the rider and the machine. And a vintage bike really needs you to operate correctly. Like if it doesn't idle well, you have to just get it more throttle, right? Yeah. Um, until Until that problem is resolved. But... It, it's not going to ride itself and that was one thing I try to impress upon guys that think that they want a vintage motorcycle I probably talk more guys out of it than 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 because I'm not I'm not hurting for business and Steve it sounded like you said you were in the uh, the movie industry I, I'm with the Teamster Union 399 the oh, Hollywood cool. team. so yeah. I, I day play and jump in and out doing that got to pay the bills somehow man <laughs> yeah cross T's and dot I's and I've been six or seven years but um I, I would rather be involved in projects that I really want to be a part of that can turn into something really fantastic, something that really makes an impression on the builder community and motorcycles in general, than, uh, than just try to half-ass a few things together and save a buck where they can be saved so that someone can have uh, a mediocre experience on a bike that is more expensive than if they went and bought something brand new that just you just hit the button and go uh, but if you the vintage bike thing it's like you have to have a passion and a desire to want to bring something back to life and then participate with it that's so a really a that's a really admirable thing you said there man talking somebody out of it because that's a hard thing to do especially if you're a bike builder you know because i mean if you're relying on an income to do that but you know this particular person that's interested in a bike is never going to be able to keep this thing going like tyson was saying earlier it's always going to have a problem and you were saying you you, you know it's going to have a problem that's an admirable thing to do man and i think people should should really take that to heart when they're thinking about either buying something like that a, a classic or vintage motorcycle or wanting somebody to build one for them or building one for someone. It's just, it's something that people don't really, really think out thoughtfully, I think, and clearly. You know, Tyson's got a, Tyson's got a Husky that we like to tease him about. <laughs> Our friend in uh, Las Cruces that builds Huskies likes to tell him an old Husky dirt bike is the uh, most expensive cheap bike you will ever buy. Exactly. <laughs> dude, dude. Uh, no truer words have ever been spoken. I think some people are shocked when I tell them that it's going to cost them in the high teens or low 20s to do a comprehensive build on a vintage motorcycle. But it's like, hey, I, I, I encourage you to price it out. And there was a time where I, I don't think I was good enough to say, oh, I can do things that you can't. I always tried to, I always aspire to build bikes for guys that probably had the same skill set that I did to them for the most part because it meant that philosophically we were on the same page uh, but then as the as word got out and the, and the client base changed so much it forced me into a situation to where I was building bikes for even oftentimes people I'd never even meet uh, and then uh, bikes that I'd never see again because they went overseas and so I thought all right my new philosophy has to be if something go when something goes wrong with this motorcycle and it ends up in the hands of someone else like at some other shop when they go through it them to say well it's definitely not because of something this guy did because this is a well-built motorcycle comprehensively put together it's well wired uh and there's no shortcuts 
And so that was always like, that became a mission statement, um, especially when I wasn't going to be uh, intimately involved with the people uh, that were buying these bikes or the bikes themselves anymore. So I got to ask you, um, and I'm sure you've probably talked about this a bazillion times, but when I first started following your work was on, I think it was the Caffrey Racer magazine and the TV show. Yeah. And um, you had built a Triumph Thruxton for Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. And it was that red one, but you'd chopped the tank. And so I was just getting into a modern, I'd never had modern bikes and I bought my first Thruxton and I was kind of basically modeling my build off of yours and I couldn't quite get it there. I didn't have the skill set to get it to your level at that point. But um, I got to ask you, when when he came into the shop and said, okay, I want a, a modern cafe racer, I think you were the first guy that I'd seen that had chopped up. I think he used a KZ tank to put it on the Thruxton because it had the fuel injection and all that and the rear cowl. Um, how did that whole process go? Yeah. Well, the, the actual tank came off of uh, one of those Yamaha, um, I think it's an 1100 XS11. Mm, that's a nice that's, bike. Yeah, it was, a, it was a big tank. It wasn't an XS, no, it wasn't an XS750. It was, a de- it was definitely a Yamaha tank. And the reason I used it is because, A, it was, um, I don't think that I could have built a tank myself for that because I had to hide the fuel pump in it. Mm-hmm. And the 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 actual plate the receiver plate for the fuel pump was way too complicated to try to to try to make it and the tank it would have it would have been a disaster i think and so i still wanted to use a different tank on that bike just to give it an entirely different stance but that tunnel on that fuel tank if you flip one of those things over um god the tunnel's like probably 10 inch wide so i hid a whole packed lunch underneath that tank including uh, welding the original receiver for the fuel pump into that and um, it was just a game of inches and everything fit under there I had a lot of stuff to hide because that that was a CAN bus it was a 2013 I think so it had the CAN bus system and there's really it's really not conducive to stripping out a lot of the wiring which I love old machines because you get rid of all that crusty wiring and you get it down to six or seven wires maximum and I didn't really have the luxury of doing that but that bike, that was an interesting project because I had been in contact with Ryan Reynolds prior to that. And he, uh, and all of a sudden it was crickets and I was a little concerned. So I reached back out to him and he said, oh, you know what? I ended up going with another builder for, uh, for something. I said, oh, okay, I understand. That's great, man. Hope it all works out. And, um, and he goes, hey, I really appreciate it. That was a cool response and sorry I didn't, blah, blah, blah. And then he, uh, Triumph reached out to him and what Triumph was doing was that was prior to them releasing the, I guess 15 or 16 was the first year of the new Thruxton. Uh, I think it was 16. Anyways, they- Are you talking about they, the Thruxton R? Is that the, the Thruxton yeah, R at that time? Yeah, I mean, what they did with that bike, I'm, uh, yeah, I, mean, I don't mean, I'm not berating Triumph at all, but they fixed every problem yeah. they had yeah. the first gen. Um, but they, were, they wanted to reach out to the custom builder community, which is cool, it's admirable of a, of a major marquee doing that because some companies are adamantly opposed to it. Um, and uh, anyways, they wanted to reach out to the custom builder community to probably dig up some ideas. And the idea for that bike for Ryan Reynolds was that they wanted that bike to travel around to five or six different builders and everyone was going to leave their stamp on it. Right. Wow. And they called, they called me and I said, well, a, that's not going to work because everyone's just going <laughs> to cut off at the yeah. prior you're going to have like a Japanese Akuza bike at that point, yeah. right? <laughs> no one, no one's going to sign off on that because no one's going to want to be associated with some something they disagree with or whatever the case may be. And so I said, I'm very interested in doing this, but I, I'd really rather do it uh, on my own because that's the only way it's going to come out in a way that's going to be homogenous with what you're looking for. And so they agreed to it, but it was it was Ryan Reynolds who who recommended that I do it. And I guess it was probably a way of him kind of reaching back out and saying, "Here's I'm going to give you another opportunity," um, which was great. So that project uh, it took a long time, and there were some complications and some miscommunications along the way. And uh, there was a time where I almost sort of lost interest in it, and um, but it kept turning into something. I, I loved the process because it was it really it was one of those it flex your head projects where there were things where 
was like, this is too, this is getting a little too difficult for sort of the terms that I agreed to. Um, but I'm glad that I sort of forged through all the difficulties because in that process, the uh, special projects manager, a guy named Todd Wilson, gave me a bike. It was an 06 Speedmaster. I don't know if you guys saw it. It was. It's on my Instagram. I just sold it. But it, I, it was a, a motor that the, the head had been flipped backwards. Hmm. And something that Triumph was doing for like the uh, salt flats at the time. You know, sure. that, that kind of trended for a while. And they wanted to do a reverse port style engine. And so the spe- project manager basically gave me that project in an ex- in exchange for all the time and sort of hassle that was involved with that first project and uh that turned in just more recently it's so funny how that as time manifests itself and folds out how opportunities present themselves and things that you think uh it's like future dividends i'll call it that uh, I didn't think that that project would turn into what it has become, which has given my shop a whole new bump from behind as far as fresh fresh air. But um, long story short, yeah, that that Triumph project with Reynolds, it I I appreciated the the challenge, and I don't know if you guys saw the short vignette style film thing that Ryan yeah. Reynolds narrates, yeah, but that would have been impossible to pay for to be uh, to be you know, mentioned by name by an A-list actor like that was a, a pretty cool opportunity. Well, I mean, yeah. that, that's, you know, you can't pay for that kind of publicity. I mean, right. No. It's, that's like getting, that's like Harley getting Jason Momoa to kind of rep their brand. I mean, you got, you know, you got one of the biggest A-list celebrities to, I guess, almost like kind of sponsor you in a way. Did that kind of change you and your shop overnight i mean i know you didn't change as a person or a builder but i mean that had to be kind of almost overwhelming right? uh it was it was like more like street credit i think like you we should all get into this because we're all we're all dealing with the same monster here but social media has changed perception especially like i always think about it in terms of this if there was a time in the near or not not so distant past where people knew your name and you had a marketable talent and you were let's just say quote unquote not famous but well known uh, outside of your immediate vicinity it probably meant that you had some money to go along with it right sure. I mean like just the way that information was passed and um, that's social media has undone all of that and you can very quickly per- uh, misconstrue yourself or be perceived mistakenly by the outside world looking in as something way bigger than you actually are so it's so funny watching i've done interviews and magazine stuff here at the shop and guys will come in and they go uh where do you actually put the bikes together and it's like well what do you mean here it's it's so funny why people have an idea of what they're walking into and they think well, this must mean that you have some big giant shop and you have, uh, I don't know what people's expectation is, but I just have a small, humble tin shed against the railroad tracks where I've always done this. I, it's more of a lifestyle than a, than a great living. Um, I'm not sure what people think it's supposed to have turned into. And then when you do something like that for Ryan Reynolds, I th- it changes the game again. Yeah. And then uh, it's really strange. I haven't really caught up with it. And there's, there's definitely, I don't feel like I've made any errors and mistakes as far as b- jobs that I've taken on or ways that I've marketed myself, but almost anybody could be Instagram famous now. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've got anything to show for it or uh, any validity to perceptions or anything else. It's kind of strange. Yeah. I figured I'd throw that out there because I still deal with it. Well, uh, to your point, you know, and it's a double-edged sword, right? Because the perception can be put out there that you are bigger or better than you are, which in some ways can be helpful if you, if you, if you actually do have the skill set or you have the assets to provide what people want. But if you don't, then it sort of hurts the market too, right? Because now you've got, you got somebody like you who's been building for 15, 20 years with credibility and product behind you. And you can have some new person come in that can change can market themselves in a way that they're that the perception is that they're this good or better but they really don't have the skill set so it sort of taints the industry in a way so yeah, all of us are sort of fighting that in a way i mean we deal with that even on a small level just with like the coffee shop you know we're yeah. very authentic about what we do 
It's a vintage inspired space. We actually race, we actually build, we've been riding our whole lives, but it's easy for somebody else to kind of come into that and say, oh, I do all of this stuff too, when they really don't. You know yeah, what I mean? Fair. Yeah, that's that's a, a whole, yeah, you're absolutely right. That's another a chapter of exactly what I'm presenting. And uh, honestly, it's that old adage that truth is stranger than fiction oftentimes. Um, and this fictitious environment that is so easily created with social media, um, the truth is stranger than it sometimes. Um, and I feel like I'd probably fit the bill of the, of the prior, not the latter. Uh, but I, I have no complaints. It's just one of those things that I'm, I'm hyper aware of. And uh, I try to bring everyone back. I try to plant everyone's feet again when they're here and, they're, and they have that experience of coming to my shop or, you know, um, you, you know how it is. Yeah. I think some have, if they were in your shoes, they think that their life would be very different. Yeah. And that's not necessarily the case. And it's... Um, yeah, it's just strange. I'm not sure how to how else to how else to describe it. Yeah, I think you know, for us, and I know for me personally, I think the the biggest humbling factor, because that's really what a lot of it boils down to, is being true to yourself and being humble, right? Because we all have something to learn in this lifetime, and I think the most humbling thing you can ever really do is have an old vintage bike, you know, and and have that bike break down on you. And at some point, you're going to have to go to somebody for answers, you know? And for me, I, I find some of the most knowledgeable people are these old timers in their 60s, 70s, 80s that have these old vintage machines or have these old vintage parts. And you can go to them and say, hey, man, like, what did you do for these valves at this moment? Or how did you change your geometry on this? How did you mount this wheel for this flat track bike? And these old timers that don't even have social media you know, they're always the first one to, <laughs> to kind of put you in your place. And I love yeah. that. Like, I need that personally. You know what I mean? Thank if, God for those guys. Yeah, yeah. And if not for those guys, thank God for these bikes that are, that's yeah. going to do that to you at some point. And you think about when motorcycles were first created, they were created for the types of guys who already knew how to keep them on the road. Yeah. It was just a tractor with a few less tires on it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You think of an early Indian. The thing's so hard to ride. It's got a foot clutch and all this other stuff. And it was – or you're literally hand oiling it as you're motoring down the highway. Right. It, it was designed for a very different type of guy. And uh, I try to keep – I try to stay in tune with – I try to be that guy, and I also try to cater to that individual or someone who's at least willing to appreciate that sort of philosophy and that kind of hands-on approach to using a machine that uh, people, and let's face it, people use machine, these motorcycles as, as almost like an emotional outlet. They use it as um, some, almost like an identity uh, as well, and so uh, that's, why I think that, that's why I think that some people get so bummed out when their machine lets them down is that it sort of crum their narrative crumbles they're no longer the guy with the leather jacket and boots on they're now on the side of the road with dirty with dirty fingers trying to figure out try to align themselves with the truth of this machine and that's the kind of philosophy or attitude i think you should have with almost anything nowadays because of the uh, unprecedented comfort and ease and convenience of everything it's once in a while it's actually refreshing to be slapped in the face by a vintage motorcycle on the side of the road and it kind of forces you to uh, at least slow down or if nothing else to try to get back into into touch with the truth of of a machine that you're uh, using to carry yourself through space and time that's the way I've always looked at it that's a beautiful analogy man I mean seriously that's a that's a beautiful way to sum it up and that's it's a great metaphor for our times you know that we just um just moving so fast that we don't have things like that anymore that like force us to take a step back and and have to fix it for an afternoon but yeah you know we're we're sort of coming to the end of this episode unfortunately and we hope we can totally get you on for another one man because honestly I feel like we could talk for another hour at on least, this thing. Seriously. Least, yeah. So we would, we would love to have you back. Is that something? Can we get you back on the podcast again? I'd love to, you guys. That'd be cool. I'd love to come out and see you out there. Oh, I'll, we'd love that too, dude, man. Come on yeah. out and like, you know, we can, we can definitely set you up with a couple bikes, 
I could probably put you on my vintage 550. <laughs> yeah. Or his BSA, but then we'd be having to stop and fix it every five we minutes. To stop. <laughs> we do these vintage runs and we try and keep everything uh, kickstart only. Well, aside yeah. from the BMW. Yeah. But we try and keep everything like we do a, a vintage 70s or prior run once a year. That's and it's, rad. it's super rad because, you know, again, talk about humbling mm. and putting you in your place. Like there's nothing more humbling than either breaking down on the side of the road, as you mentioned, or having an old guy pass you on another vintage bike. <laughs> <laughs> That's the hardest thing in the world. That's so true. But, but you know, I'm, I'm glad that you are um, authentic in the way that I expected you to be because, cool. you know, you build some of the best bikes I've been able to witness. Yeah. It's positive for this sport and this industry that we love, which is motorcycles. Um, the one thing I, I always uh, encourage people to do that are in the motorcycle industry is to, you, people have a funny way of sniffing out authenticity. And it's such a small community that you've got to be on your best behavior and you got to be honest. Do us a favor, man. Tell us, tell us where the shop is and how people can get a hold of you and uh, just find out more information about you. Yeah, my shop is in North County, LA. It's in Newhall. I'm tucked up against the railroad tracks in a very unassuming building. I've been here for about 13 or 14 years after a series of two car garages that I was forcibly removed from uh, by uh, the city enforcement agencies and all that kind of stuff. They no longer believe that it was a hobby of mine. I'll put it that way. Yeah, and then the email is at uh, Dustin Cott. It's K O T T. Uh, at gmail.com and then uh, you know I'm, I'm right on the roadside too I once in a while people are shocked they're like oh my gosh this is cop motorcycles I've heard of this I just didn't know it was here so I've got a little street side appeal uh, that sometimes serves me well uh, but yeah that's how you can find me and I'll, I have no intentions of stopping, so I'll be here until they want to level this building and turn it into a bike path. Yeah, yeah. let's hope that doesn't happen. Uh, thanks again there, Dustin. We really, really enjoyed talking to you. It was great meeting you at uh, Hand Built a few years ago, and hope you can make it through here in Albuquerque sometime soon. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. You be safe out there, and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. You do. You do the same. See ya. Well, man, I think that was as cool as we thought it was going to be. Um, what would you think, Tyson? I was really impressed with that BMW that we mentioned on the podcast when we went to the handbuilt show. I think that was the one that really caught all of our eyes. And uh, it's really cool to hear somebody as big as, as Dustin in the motorcycle world still be as humbled as he is probably from the very start of when he first got into motorcycling. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think it's, I mean, I'd like to think it's because, you know, you come from sort of a, uh, like a working class background like we all did, right? Like he mentioned being young and not having two pennies to rub together, but he had a dirt bike and and you like to think that, you know, that sets a standard for you as you as you get older and as you start becoming more successful, you kind of remember what it was like to not be able to afford a lot of stuff. I mean, like you and I both come from a background like that working class background, you know, trying to uh, just trying to make it work with what you got. Sure. And I think you and I still do that. I mean, you know, we, we still, you know, get old bikes and we do it as, as inexpensively as we can and try and make the most of it. And I think that gives us an appreciation. I know for me, I know for me, it gives me an appreciation for it. We got our buddy Cash Dog here in the house <laughs> running around making some noise. So we had to do the, the podcast at my house because uh, Dustin being in uh, Los Angeles right now, his time zone was a little off and we couldn't do the podcast at the coffee shop as we usually do. But we're here at the house, Cash and, and Grayson are running around freaking out and making the best out of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun, man. It's like having a studio audience. Yeah. Uh, I think the other thing too, that I think keeps Dustin pretty humble, as he mentioned, was uh, working on old bikes. You know, it's never going to go the way you expect. And there's always something that you have to learn or something that you have to fix, right? In in the vintage motorcycle world. And it's never gonna be perfect the first time around. So that's also like one of the beautiful things I think about having a vintage bike and working on vintage bikes. Yeah. Is it's there's always something that's gonna throw you for a loop. Yeah. So that's part of the excitement. I mean, yeah. I think that's for some of us, I think that's the appeal, honestly. You sound very excited when you said that. And I just, I, I think to, of all the bikes I've got in the garage right now, and they're all vintage bikes and all the things that I need to do to them. So, uh, you know, it, it's a little tiring when you think about that work list, but, but it's also an education for me. I love learning new things. And, uh, I have to tell you, and you know, this working on old bikes, you're always learning something new. Yeah, definitely. And, um, 
Speaking of which, you said we couldn't do it from the shop today because uh, the time of day, the shop is getting so busy, man. I mean, I'm excited to see new people coming into the coffee shop. This weekend has been super busy. People from around the country that are traveling have stopped in and they say, hey, you know, we've seen the YouTube series or we've heard the podcast and we kind of wanted to see, you know, what the shop looks like. And I know for me the other day I was working and somebody stopped in and they said, it looks exactly like I pictured it. And that's kind of rare. I think sometimes you have an, a perception of what something looks like and then you get there and it's completely different, yeah. but they're like, it looks like what we thought it would look like. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. Yeah, but <laughs> I hope they weren't expecting like a Deus or something huge. <laughs> I don't know, but, but they seemed happy. They liked the coffee. They liked the new food that we're getting in there. So, um, which is cool, right? We got some new, yeah. uh, some new items on the menu. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we had to go back to a, a local vendor for our, our vegan biscuits. Um, and those are those are turning out super great and good. We're using uh, Dragonfire Smokehouse, which does. He also does like some some meat products. So he has like, you know, meat tri tip kind of burritos. But then he's also for our customers and our clientele. He decided to help us out and do some vegan burritos and vegan biscuits, which are really great. Um, so those have been taking off kind of well. Cool. And if you are out there listening to this podcast and you happen to be coming through New Mexico, take a ride through Albuquerque and uh, stop at the shop. We're at 3732 Eubank Boulevard Northeast in Albuquerque. You're, you can find us pretty easily off of major streets. So uh, we'd love to hear your story, ride in, drive in, however you're coming through Albuquerque, we'd love to meet you. Um, we have an official podcast at rustisgoldcoffee.com, which we'll be updating regularly with information about events and specials and things going on with the series and the shop. Our YouTube channel is youtube.com at rustisgoldgarage. We'll be releasing another episode next month so that'll bring us up to six episodes and we're getting good feedback on those people seem to find them funny we enjoy doing them uh keep listening to the podcast we appreciate it if you'd like to support the podcast go to our patreon site at rust is gold coffee and garage and support us with anything you feel comfortable with we appreciate the support ride safe and we will see you on the next ride down the way, not too far, an old time rockin' belly coffee bar. Wreck a machine tucked in the back, Elvis singing about a Cadillac. I'm on a BSA, been riding all day. Leather's on, goggles too, triumphing that don't know what you wanna do. My baby's on a Vincent, has been for quite a while. She said it's rockin' just to style. So let's ride, so let's ride, so let's ride. Turn up, I got lovely camps American rocker is a matter of fact 